Dorothy says, I can't stand the lies any longer. All of my voting life, I have voted SNP. I can't do it anymore. I'm glad that you can't. And uh, that brings to mind this article, link in support for yes and the SNP decisively broken research finds. And this is from the National on the 7th of August 24. The link between Scots' views on independence and how they vote for parliamentary parties came to a, quote, decisive end in the 2024 general election, according to new research. The new research published by the Scottish election study in the wake of the election has now pointed to a slight correlation in the opposite direction. Areas which voted yes in 2014, in the 2014 referendum, are now less likely to back the SNP than areas which voted no. It found that more yes voters now back unionist parties than vice versa. And it also found, quote, that the SNP lost more support in yes voting areas than no voting ones. Isn't that interesting? The research aligns with observations made by polling expert Professor John Curtis ahead of the general election. In April 23, Curtis told the National that more and more 2014 yes voters were saying they would not vote SNP, which he said was a problem for the party. That's certainly a problem for the party, isn't it? And in, in yesterday's paper, to back up what I'm saying here, Kevin McKenna in the Herald says, I'm now glad we didn't win in 2014. By we, he means the people who voted yes in 2014, which included, included him. Although he wasn't a particularly strong yes voter, I voted yes because I wanted us to be able to sign our own checks and to make our own mistakes and not to be blaming the English for any of our failures. Well, I'm sorry if you don't understand the Scottish psyche, but the Scottish psyche among some people will always be to blame the English for particular failures. That's, that's just a fact, sir. However, the fact remained that for him, independence would never be as important as faith, family, or the fortunes of my favourite football club. Crikey. Let's break up the United Kingdom, but that's not as important as the fortunes of my favourite football club. Anyway, he goes on to say, it's tempting to choose from a large suite of SNP policy failures to show why these people could never have been entrusted with the added responsibilities that full independence would have conferred. What has been unforgivable, though, is how the SNP has created a climate of fear across every sector in which it runs. Just as unconscionable is how this party now openly rewards mediocrity and infantilism, while people of real talent are bullied. The SNP has developed a deep loathing of working class communities and nowhere was this more evident than in its hate crime legislation. This formed part of a pattern that started with the absurd named persons legislation. It continued with its minimum unit alcohol pricing legislation. Sitting alongside this is the substantive threat that exists within the SNP towards women and girls. Luckily, the UK government's use of a Section 35 order removed some of the jeopardy embedded at the heart of the proposed GRR legislation. In the 10 years since the independence referendum, the SNP has become a menace to the people of Scotland, especially women and poor people. Not until all those who helped create this climate of of fear and loathing are removed, can any of us even think about an independent Scotland? 
the SNP has ruined it for an entire generation and made Scotland a darker place. Oh, my goodness me. I'm now glad we didn't win in 2014. That was Kevin McKenna in, in the Herald, 27th of August, 2024. He was sticking it to them there. Crikey. <laughs> 